I was at home one night watching television and I saw a little news flash that said there was a little small problem at platform A and that uh, was nothing to worry about. Everything was under control. So the next morning I went out to platform A to pull my traps and there was a lot of problem and things weren't under control and there was this huge bubble of natural gas and oil coming up by the northeast leg of the platform. I'd say the gas and bubble was probably 10 to 15 feet high. Just like if you take a hose and hold it under water and turn it on and make it bubble up, it was similar to that. There was once a lovely little town on the coast of California where people lived in nice houses with red tiled roofs surrounded by geraniums, bougainvillea, and star jasmine. They went to their beautiful beach often to enjoy the sand, the sun, the water, and the sweet, clean air. With the lyrical name of Santa Barbara, it was a wonderful place to live, to work, and to raise children. The people that lived in Santa Barbara considered themselves very fortunate. But then a darkness came. On January 28, 1969, a natural gas blowout fractured the ocean floor below a newly constructed offshore oil drilling platform. The workers on the platform knew something was seriously wrong, but they did not immediately disclose it, trying desperately to repair it themselves. However, within 24 hours, someone made an anonymous call to the offices of the Santa Barbara News Press, the area's most widely read newspaper. Late in the morning, we got a call, and they, it was a male voice said the ocean is boiling around platform A and uh, I started to ask questions and this person said the ocean is boiling around platform A goodbye and I don't know to this day who that person was and in the area of my crab pots there was probably four inches of oil on the water at that time the weather was okay that day um, uh, well, that night, the southeast wind brought the oil into Santa Barbara Harbor, and it came into the beaches and came onto the harbor and filled the harbor up with oil. Once the black tide reached shore, news coverage was immediate. The spill, as it was more commonly called, was just a two-hour drive up the coast from Los Angeles and was quickly carried by news media around the country and around the world. I believe when I first heard about the oil spill, it was on uh, television, on the news, and um, it was quite a popular subject because it affected so many people. I had particular concern, and I decided to go see it for myself to uh, know firsthand what it had uh, done and so that's what I did is I went and uh, went to the beach and uh, witnessed it for myself. But, uh, we woke up that morning and it smelled like tar and went outside. I thought someone perhaps was tarring the road but uh, they weren't and soon enough uh, neighbors started to gather also and ask what was going on and someone tuned in to the local radio news and discovered there'd been an oil spill down at the beach. So uh, we all went down there like lemmings. The community just started uh, pouring out onto the beach 
and um, what we found was shocking. The oil kept coming. It was very heavy, black. Uh, in time, uh, the water was all black. The ocean was dead. I was a young mother living in uh, the community and uh, raising my family. Had moved uh, to this area from graduate school studies. Of my husband, he was a new young professor at UC Santa Barbara, and I was living. Uh, we were living in Goleta. We saw the ocean as an important part of our family life because it was a focus of our recreation. I don't, I don't remember it specifically because it was a major news item, um, but the effects of it, it took just a little bit of time to, to be absorbed by most of us. Um, uh, those who were right on the shore immediately reacted and knew, though none of us knew how permanent and long-lasting and devastating the impact would be it, that unfolded over time. It seemed to be like a nightmare that never stopped. It was uh, it, it was it was kind of scary in in seeing the seriousness of the adults around us and the type of equipment that they had. Um, there were bulldozers on the beach and uh, people dressed in, you know, all these suits and outfits that were completely covering their bodies to protect them from the oil penetration. Uh, it, it was kind of scary just wondering where it was all going to lead and, and it seemed like it was just this continuous flow coming in. It didn't seem like they were, you know, it's not like a simple fix. The uh, beach was covered with oil and and the uh, everything was covered with oil and the smell was so terrible at our house that I, I think we even we moved I'm not sure if we moved out for a while because the smell of the oil was so strong coming into our house it was the first time after being here for about 10 years or so 9 years or so that it wasn't the same questions about how beautiful the place was, it was how are you guys dealing with it? Uh, what's real on, on the news? And, and um, so it, it changed the way we kind of perceived our hometown to be, and that was sad. The sight of the oil on what had been a beautiful beach, and especially seeing dead and dying sea mammals, fish, and birds, had a profound effect on persons, particularly when they realized that the blowout was the result of the oil company's calculated effort to save money. Um, then there's other extremes where they definitely, you know, do try to cut corners. That's what happened with the 1969 oil spill. Uh, Unical convinced the federal government to allow them not to um, install casings all the way down um, the level that they were going to drill and what happened is there was a blowout below um, where they installed the casings. Now had they installed the full casings, the blowout probably wouldn't have happened. Well, you know it's really difficult when you're looking at something and, and there's nothing you can do and they're just dying, you know, because they can't breathe anymore because they're just covered in oil and you know, and, and they're looking at you with their eyes, and you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's too hard to bear, really. It's, it's overwhelming. It's just very over overwhelming, and you know, it's one thing to see like a, an inanimate object, like a tree or something like that, but when you're looking, a seal is dying in front of you. And even whales actually weren't even dead yet. They were there on the ocean, and they were just on the beach, just covered with stuff, and birds. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's horrible. There's just no other way to put it, it's just horrible. Violated. It's a very powerful experience to be at the front line of an environmental disaster. Uh, I can only uh, think with great feeling about those who are living in the area that uh, experienced the earthquake in, in Japan. Um, it is, it, it's earth-shaking, uh, an accident of such significant, or an event of such significant magnitude. In my home, 
my apartment and the beach right in my front yard essentially was now fouled. It was something that I felt a deep sickness. I think there was also at that time a real understanding that this is what man was capable of in the worst way. I, as I mentioned, I was opposed to war, but I had not experienced war. Here I was experiencing environmental degradation of the worst kind. And so it was something that my senses were very, very uh, open. And it was something that uh, on every level was just almost more than you could handle. And I will never forget, and I sometimes will draw on that experience, of the animals that were covered with this tar, this, this black goo. Called to a congressional hearing, the president of Union Oil said, I don't like to call it a tragedy. There's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for a few birds. His callousness angered the citizens of Santa Barbara, and while the cleanup was still in process, they began to meet, first in small groups, then in larger, to discuss what steps they could take to protect the coastline from the oil industry. And uh, I have a friend named uh, Dick Smith, who was a reporter for the news press, the local newspaper. He was flying over the channel this particular day, and he saw a big blowout going uh, underneath, underneath a uh, platform in the channels. It was Platform A, the Union Platform A. And he saw this big platform. He phoned me from his airplane and said, there's a big blowout going out here, bud. What are we going to do about it? And I said, I right away, I got so angry. I just screamed out, we got to get oil out. And my boss was in the next office and he said, hey, get oil out, goo. Good name. Um, you have all these these, these photos. Tell, tell us about <clears throat> the day that you uh, decided to take photos. And... Well, I went down, and this is about the fifth or sixth day. Finally, they were bringing a lot of machinery and manpower in to start some kind of cleanup. I don't think they'd had this experience anywhere in the United States that I can think of uh, experience in doing this. So it's sort of haphazard. I think they were throwing everything against the wall, hoping something would stick. They had boats out in the harbor which were spreading hay mm -hmm. and uh, hoping to absorb uh, that mass amount of oil. Actually, there was so much oil there, it looked like maybe four or five inches on the surface. There, were no, there was no wave action. And instead of the water being blue or blue-greenish color, it was black, which was very strange. I noticed in the, the oil spill in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, their oil was sort of brown color. This is unique. We must have a different grade. It was just pitch, pitch black and there was very little wave action even coming onto the beaches. It made this funny little slurry sound when it, when, like, when it came ashore, sort of weird. And the smell was overwhelming. You know, it was just a... It was a story that galvanized the community. And as a young person, it certainly was a different experience because now in the classes, we were talking about it, and there were some really wonderful educators, and I think that it was my opportunity. I was in Rod Nash's class at the time, and so I was getting a lot of that perspective from him firsthand as a student. And it was part of what you just layered on and it became part of my culture. From towns and cities all up and down the coast, volunteers came spontaneously to help with the cleanup of the water, the beach, and the animals that were affected. Anyway, what happened is that out there, then they started spraying dispersant in state and federal waters. And then they passed the law, they couldn't spray it in state waters, so they sprayed it in federal waters. Well, it, it would, the current would take it right into state waters, but to make this stuff work good, they, they ran crew boats back and forth through the oil to mix it up with the dispersant, which made it sink. And doing that, they cut the buoys off of my traps with their propellers, because you couldn't see them, because they were all coated with oil and low in the water. And so I lost about two thirds of my 80 traps out there. It was uh, an oil that, um, it, it was oppressive. And then the, the death, 
that was associated with it because we were seeing as you go down the birds and they would be tarred and they would be struggling and they would die. And even when you tried to take them to the receiving centers, you knew that this was very small chance that there was going to be any survival and that was the reality. The, the techniques were just brand new. How do you deal with something like this? People didn't know. And so everything that they tried in my mind seemed to be just a failure. It was a stopgap. It was a wish, a hope, and a prayer. And we didn't have much success. And the manpower, they built these little dinghy boats and they'd have two guys in it and they'd have a barrel in the center and they would go out in around the harbor and around the boats and they would pick up this straw with pitchforks again and put them in the barrel that was in between the, you know, between the two and these little tiny boats. It, it, it really wasn't very effective, I don't think. Fishermen, whose livelihood was immediately affected by the spill, were hired by the oil company to help with the cleanup with mixed results. Well, I, I, I had a chance when I came in the first night and the oil was coming in the harbor and they put these booms out, I, uh, they hired fishermen to go out there and guard the booms and tow them around. And that was the first time that I'd ever worked for an oil company directly, right, for Union Oil. And, and the pay was $15 an hour for you, your boat, and a crewman. And other fishermen, uh, mostly abalone divers with small boats that were saltwater cooled engines, were out by the boom and the hay was being blown all over the water. And so I just stayed on my boat all night and in the following morning I, I went to the guy and said, hey, uh, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I've been standing by over there. And he says, well, I want you to go out there by the boom and, 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 and push on those booms. And, I, I said, no, I, I'm, that's, I don't want to do it because what had happened during the night is that the, the abalone boats had sucked the straw up into their intakes and burned up their engines. And these big spikes that were in the pilings holding them together with rope were, as the boats were bouncing up and down, they were poking the holes and stuff in them. And I, for $15 an hour, I'm not going to ruin my boat. So that was the end of my working for Union Oil. Richard Nixon, a Californian who'd been inaugurated as President of the United States only two weeks before, visited the area to inspect the damage. His signature is on the National Environmental Policy Act, which is today the, the most important federal law on how uh, federal agencies have to protect the environment. His signature is also on the act that created the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. His signature is on the, uh, the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1970, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Uh, these, are, these acts together are probably the most litigated environmental law in U.S. history. While the County of Santa Barbara continued its work to clean up the beaches and the harbor, federal legislation was sponsored in both the House of Representatives and the Senate to provide for greater protection of the environment. Like many initiatives in Washington, the effort was made to gain political advantage. Uh, Nixon was able to sign so many important pieces of legislation, in part because he was a rival of some members of Congress who were going to run for president or were planning on making a presidential run in 1972. The best example is actually Ed Muskie, the senator from Maine, who was most responsible for pushing through the water pollution control amendments of 1972, which also have Nixon's signature on them. Uh, Nixon wanted to be ahead of Muskie on this issue, and Muskie wanted to be ahead of Nixon. So it wasn't really a spirit of bipartisan cooperation. It was really rivalry, which probably explains just about everything that Nixon did anyway. So, 1969 was a terrific catalyst uh, to a, a whole set of regulations. We had none before then. You know, we had the Love Canal and uh, Cuyahoga River that were burning. We had so many events at that time that gave strong reason for us to take legislative action. But now, you know, the, we, we see uh, a sort of a, um, resurgence of 
of pushback against those uh, those uh, actions. Uh, and I'm working in a climate that is very difficult in terms of protecting our environment. Santa Barbarans were determined to take a more active role in the interaction between their county and the oil companies. And locally, the Santa Barbara uh, County Board of Supervisors uh, was, became completely hostile to the oil industry. Um, one of the executives at Union Oil complained a few years later that, that OPEC was easier to deal with than the Santa Barbara Board of Supervisors. Californians in general did not find that the federal legislation created enough protection for their coastline, which was threatened by massive development as well as the potentially devastating effects of offshore oil drilling. The environmental activism motivated by the spill became direct political action in two ways. Uh, it became local action, which strengthened all the local laws in the Santa Barbara area, but it also became the Proposition 20, the initiative in California that created the California Coastal Act. Well, we didn't realize that uh that the federal, the, the platforms were in federal waters that we couldn't touch. But we did go to the state with our petitions after we had several thousands of petition signers, and they did re respond. The state did eventually re remove, I think it was uh, Proposition 20. They did remove all the platforms from the state waters, which was a great success for goo. The California initiative process, which is authorized by the state's constitution, allows the citizenry to bypass the legislature and the governor and enact legislation by collecting a certain number of signatures of registered voters and then passing it with a majority vote in a general election. Proposition 20 is an example of a California initiative that passed in 1972 to create the California Coastal Act. Its mission is to preserve public access to the beach and protect coastal wildlife. It provides for a more balanced review process for all development proposals for the entire California coastline. The immediate public reaction to the 1969 oil disaster not only catalyzed federal and state legislation, it also revitalized existing environmental groups in the Santa Barbara area, as well as creating new organizations that remain active decades later. My grandfather was on the first board of GOO, uh, Vernon Johnson, um, and I think Sometime around when I was in my early teens, actually, is the first time I actually heard anybody talk about it. And it was Vernon and people talking something about Get Oil Out. And it didn't really register uh, his involvement in that or what that meant, but I understood that there was a big spill and that he got involved in the fight to deal with it or to stop it. Widespread support grew for the implementation of federal, state, and local legislation to protect the environment. While these laws continue to protect the air and water for all Americans, the relevance of the spill has not faded in the minds of average Santa Barbarans. Protect Santa Barbara, California, and the oceans because say, we are a model for these United States. Eliminate all offshore drilling off the coast of California and any other coast as well. If I were to ask the president to do one thing, it would be not only to extend and stand by the moratoriums that have been put in place, but to find some way that they would always be there. The protection of the California coastline and the environment that surrounds this planet will soon depend on the next generation of citizen activists. They are students sitting in today's high schools, colleges, and universities. Young citizens who understand the importance and need to protect the environment and care enough to be vigorously involved in democratic processes, as well as through their personal actions. I want them to know that we are dependent on them to be the kind of leaders in their world 
uh, where they see the value and the importance of the ocean in their lives and in our lives together and that they dedicate themselves in some way uh, wh and whether it is through their occupation or their future lives in protecting that resource and and know that they have a very vital role to play and all the way from the the occupation that they choose to engage in which could it, it be affected that way but just in the way that they appreciate and value and work uh, with the environment to protect it. As you can tell, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil blowout is still alive in the hearts and minds of many Californians. But time moves inexorably forward. The day will ultimately come when those who were there are no longer here. So before then, those of us old and young who wish to leave to our children access to clean beaches and water with flourishing wildlife must become active in coastal issues. These beautiful beaches, this sweet smelling air, is an achievement that requires constant vigilance combined with energetic involvement in the processes of democracy. It's up to us.